James, Lord, and I know that you have a beautiful message for your children. I know that we may have came in tired. Maybe we're just dealing with issues of life. But Lord, you have given us victory over every circumstance, over every financial issue, over every health issue. Oh, Jesus, you're still on the throne and you're still blessing and you're still healing, Lord. And you're still answering the prayers of your children, even those who have gone astray. Oh, Father God, compel us and use us here this evening. Speak to us. And Lord, we thank you that you have came to commune with us this evening, Lord. That you have come and you have encountered angels as far as the east is from the west and the north to the south. They are protecting this building and they're protecting every other pastor that is preaching the living word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the church yeah. says, Amen. Well, you know what? As we get started, we're back in the book of James. How many of you are excited? We took a break because we did a series on prayer because we needed it, right? So turn to James, the fourth chapter. And the title of this evening's message is The Humble Character of a Christian. Wow. The Humble Character of a Christian. And you know what? When I was studying this word, oh my Lord, he just hit me. He hit me hard. And he says, you know, the problem with my children is I could be right in front of their face. But there's no humbleness. Cool. You know, they're looking to what they're going to do the next minute, what they're going to do the next day, the next week. They have no time for me. And I want to share something before we read because people have come up to me. Sunday, we had an interpretation of tongues. Yeah. It was the first time that this church has ever done that. Yeah. And it was not planned. Nobody knew about it. You know, we came in and we were obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that I don't know if you were not here on Sunday, but Jesus himself was sitting amongst his children. Yes. I mean, he was with each and every one of us and he spoke to us. And, you know, I've never been used in that way. And, and it's actually frightening for me, to be honest with you, because it's such reverent. I, I can't even pronounce it. It's such righteousness, such holiness, that I'm like, Lord, I was even afraid to be used as a vessel, but he used us. And somebody interpreted what God had spoken to us. So you know what? He had an appointment with us, and he's not done. He has an appointment with us here this evening. So as we get ready, let's turn to James chapter 4 and read verses 1 through 10. And you know how we do it in ancient of days, right? Even amen over there. So where do wars and fights come from among you? There's a question. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that a friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And the church says, hey. listen, what a way to start this chapter. You know, James is dealing with the church who has gone astray. James is dealing with the church that is no different than today, right? They're running after the things of this world and they're friends with this world. And God says that if you are friends with this world, you are at war with me. And you know, as I spoke this, there are so many prideful individuals that we can't even submit to God the way God requires us to submit to Him. We're those stiff necks, we're those whitewashed tombs that maybe some of us didn't even want to be here, or we don't want to be here because God is not the priority of our life. 
But let me tell you something as we get into the book of James. That when we die and we meet our maker, you're going to pray to God that you had a relationship with him. Because if you don't, you're going to end up in a place that you don't want to be. And you know what? That's why we have to take God for him. He is holy and he is a righteous God. And you know what? God is not going to put himself upon you if you do not want him or if you do not receive him. God is a gentleman. He will step aside and he will allow you to do what you want to do. But there is a time, church, where when we take our last breath, it says absent from the body, present to with the Lord. And we will come in front of him and he will begin to hold us, each and every one of us, accountable if we have not repented or we have been friends with the world and at war with God. See, that has to change. What a way to start this chapter. Let's go back to verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? He's asking a question. And he's not talking about a street fight out in the street. He's not talking about two gangs coming together and fighting for territory. He is talking about the Christians fighting amongst one another. And he starts off like this. James accurately describes strife amongst Christians with the terms war, right, and fights. And you know the greatest thing about the Christian is we don't need the devil to destroy us. We do a good job of destroying ourselves. Because the church is a place where people should come, right? People who are lost, people who are addicted to drugs, people who don't have hope. People who have just lost any kind of sense of human nature and they should be able to come into the house of God and they should be able to look upon each and every one of us and we don't judge them. We love them because Christ loved us while we were yet sinners. Yes. Let me tell you a humbling situation that occurred to me. I get here early. I got to that front door and there was a seven year old man on the floor. I didn't know if he was alive or dead. And he was crying like a baby. And I went to go look at him and he looked up at me and he had the, the whatever you want to call it, the mocos coming out of his nose that were frozen. And he says, you know what? He goes, I live on the real, real ground ditch banks. He goes, I'm cold. And I said, come on in. I go, come on in and let me get the heat going. And I said, let me get you warm. And you know the craziest thing that if you ask God to use you, and if we're not fighting amongst each other, but we're asking God to use us, I came in with a nice set of gloves and a sweater, and guess what? He left with them. And he came in, I asked him if he wanted coffee, he said no. He said, I'm hungry and I need to get warm. He's 70 some years old, and he sat right there at that chair crying and crying, saying, I don't have no family, I don't have no place to go. He goes, I'm cold. He goes, I live on the riverbanks. And yet we as the body of believers are fighting against one another. See, we're at friends with the world, but we're at war with God. There is nothing that this world can offer you. No kind of paycheck, no amount of money, nothing that this world can ever offer you that God is willing to give you. And if we're not fighting with each other and we're loving each other, we are an inspirational hope to a person that God has put at that front door. He only stayed in here for 10 minutes and then he was gone. I told him, go get you something to eat. I don't know if I was entertaining an angel. I don't know who he was. I just know that God put him at the footsteps of a church. And the building is not the church. The church is you. And he didn't put him at the footsteps so that we could come in and be at strife with one another. To be offended with one another. He brought him here so that we can build ourselves up in the living word of God. And we can help people that he sends our way. Yes. You see where James is going? Why is there wars and fights among you? There shouldn't be. Right now, the gospel is going forward, right? You know what should be happening? It should be building your foundation up so that you can love more, that you can forgive more, that you can ask God to use me more. You know what? There are so much people out there that are in need of a Christian believer saved by the blood of Jesus Christ that can empower them, can love them, and can lead them into salvation's way. But guess what? We come to the cross. We're good. We don't want to do nothing with what we're good with. 
You know, some of us have to be drugged to church. But guess what? Do we have to be drugged to a party? Do we have to be drugged to a football game? Do we have to be drugged to something that enjoys, that our flesh enjoys doing? No. We don't have to be talked into doing those things. We have to be talked into come to church because we're stiff-necked. And James goes on to say, why are there wars amongst you people? The battle shouldn't be happening amongst the Christian. The battle should be being, being taken to the enemy's territory. Where the Christian stands up and says, go on forth, you Christian soldier. That's where the battle takes place. But the battle is taking place here in our hearts with offense, with laziness, with everything else that rebels its ugly head against a living and a righteous God. You see, he goes on to say, see, he does not mean war within a man. Catch me. But he says war against one another. You know, as a pastor, what I've learned so much because I was a stiff neck. You know what? We can look at people and you can tell when the person just doesn't want to be here. And you know what? That breaks my heart because I was that person that didn't want to be here. I was that person that, you know what? They had to talk me into going to church. And now I realize that church is where my healing and my help comes from. It's not from man. It's not from my job. It's not from the car that I drive or the house that I live in. It's because there is power in the name of Jesus. And when we come into the house of God, he empowers us to go forth and to spread the living gospel of the living God. Why? Because you are holy. You are holy in his sight. He sent his son to die for you. He saw something in you that the world does not see. Only the thing that the world sees is that if you get closer to God, you are now at war with the enemy. But the devil says that's fight amongst each other. You guys fight all you want to fight. And I'll stand back and watch you guys destroy each other. See, James is coming hard right now. And I, you know what I pray for? Lord, give me a book that it's all about joy, peace, love, walking in the daisies, the flowers. But every time I read the word, it's not always about that. Yeah. It's about God telling Israel that you are an adulteress. Yeah. See, we see the word adulteress and we think, oh, that you're doing something against your spouse or your wife. No, the word adulteress in Greek that he's talking about is when you turn away from God. And Israel has been doing this since the book the beginning of the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, and we're doing it here in 2020. See, listen. Verse 1. Underline this in the scripture. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war with your members? Excuse me, I have that. James says, Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war with your members? What are your members? I can tell you one right here. Anything attached to me is my member. You know what Romans 12, 5 says? Write it down and you can read it later. One body, which is Jesus Christ. It didn't say, oh, ancient of days, his place, holy family, holy rosary. See, we segregate ourselves. No, it's one body in Jesus Christ. He is the only God, and He's the only God that, that we are to serve. It doesn't say we serve ancient of days. We serve His place. We serve Calvary. We serve. We don't serve any of those. So we serve one body, which is Christ Jesus. And He goes on to say many members. Yes. So the person sitting next to you is a member of that body. Yeah. Like this little pinky is a member of my body. Let me tell you something. The most neglected part of the body can be the worst to break. See, we take care of our physical physique and our physical desires, but we neglect the spiritual. Let me tell you what I meant by that. Have you ever broken your tongue? Or the little piggy at the end of your feet? Try breaking that little guy. He breaks very easy. All you have to do is hit him up against the side of a wall or something in the middle of the night. And when you break that little guy, for some of us that use our feet all the time, we're always up and down. You can't really move the way you're used to moving when that little guy's broken. But he's the most neglected. You know what's crazy? The feet are the most neglected part of the human body. I mean, come on, you wanna see scales and I'm not talking on a fish? Go swimming with some of y'all, man. 
You don't even know what lotion is. You got scales. You neglect the part of your body that holds up the whole physique. Am I going somewhere? Come on, flood out me, out, man. Because sometimes they think I'm crazy. We neglect our feet. You know what I am? I'm not going to get too much into this because I got to get back into the word. But I have a foot thing. Man, you go to the gym, and I always, when I go to the gym, I hit the jacuzzi and the steam rooms and all that, and you see these good looking guys, man, buff, big. Man, they're good looking. The, the girls love them. They take off their shoes and their socks, and you're like, oh. why are those suckers green? There ain't no toenail clipper in the world that's gonna cut those nails. We neglect the part that holds up the whole body the way the Christian neglects the spiritual part in us that is alive and that does not die. You see where I'm going? Right? And I went somewhere where I don't even know if I can go back because I just kind of <laughs> lost myself. You're in bad shape when you lose yourself, right? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure and war of your members? See, the source of this war and fight is amongst the Christians. And there is a root to carnality. James is talking about a root to carnality. You know what that means? Is when something in your life takes root that is above God, it's hard to break. There is a root right now within the Christian church. And you know what God's been telling me lately? I don't know about you, but how many of you have the heavenly language of speaking in tongues? Don't be shy, man. God gave that. Hold it up. Hold up your feet, whatever you got to hold up. Hold it up. We weren't shy that we said, oh, my favorite drink is tequila. <laughs> Mad Dog 2020, man. We were the first one holding them both hands up. But when it comes to God's gifts, we're like, hold it up. Amen. See, nobody's ever heard my language. Even my wife doesn't even hear me speak in, in tongues. But lately, man. I've been driving and God's been giving me my holy language and I've just been speaking in tongues. Because you know what God told me? He goes, my spirit is pouring upon my children. But there are those that are not going to receive me. There are those that are so broken and full of holes that when I pour through them, it's going to empty out of them. He goes, let me heal you. Let me seal every crack. Let me seal everything that causes you to be leaky. And let me begin to fill myself in you because as I begin to fill in you, you begin to overflow. This is what God told me on the way here. And as you begin to overflow, it's not going to waste, church. It's going to touch those that need that healing power. It's going to overflow onto somebody in your family. It's going to be a loved one who has not gone to church, who does not believe in God no more. It's going to be a co-worker who has a, a spouse who's dying of cancer or maybe going through heart surgery and they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know what to do. And you're going to be overflowing with the spirit of the living God. And as you get near them, they're going to feel the presence of God's holiness. And you're going to have an opportunity to pray for them. You're going to have an opportunity to look in their eyes. And all they see is the light of Jesus Christ, his holiness, his righteousness. Do you see what we're losing? Because we're fighting amongst one another. When we should be loving one another, we should be standing firm upon the living word of God. We should shun the ways of the world. I don't want no drug because the Holy Spirit is the ultimate drug. He fills me up. He pours me and he flows me to overflow. And he touches those around me. I don't need no beer because beer causes me to stumble and stray away from God. All I need, Lord, is you. Yes. That's all I need. Yes. That's all I want. Yes. Guess what? You offend me? Praise be to God, I love you. You take it up to God. How many of you are done walking in unforgiveness? Come on. Yes. Some of you right now, God is telling me, you have somebody in your life that you won't forgive. Because you're pointing, say, they did this to me, Pastor. You don't know what they put me through. But I look at you and I say, what did you put God through when he loved you? Come on. Yes, yes. You can't get an amen? Amen. Because you know how it works at eight in a day? I'll give myself an amen. Amen, Pastor Preach. Because you know what? I'm not preaching to a bunch of goats. I'm preaching to sheep who need a shepherd. I'm preaching to those who have gone astray. They need to come back into the multitude of numbers because in the multitude where there are numbers, there is protection. When you are weak, you are strong. And when you are weak, she is strong. We need one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to love one another. We need to uphold each other's hands. 
And we need to stand under the banner of not our name, but the banner of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, Lord. Jesus. The root to carnality, it's not an outside war. Can I say this? It's an inward war. It's in your heart right now. There are roots that have taken place in your heart and we need to remove them and we cannot remove them because we tell somebody, remove them. We need to seek the presence of a holy God and when his holiness comes to that which is unholy, he will remove it. Yes, yes. He will get rid of it. He will disintegrate it. Why? Because you can't do it. But I can do all things. See, okay, I love when people repeat that scripture. I'm not picking on you, but you repeated it. I love when you guys repeat scripture, but I don't love when you don't stand on it. Woo, come on, give me those eyes, give me those looks. I've been there. I've been, I've done that. Oh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. As long as things are good, God. Mm -hmm. Go out there in the middle of the cold. You got a flat tire and everybody in the church has gone home and it's just you in the car. Yeah. I can do all things to God and strengthen me. You go to the back of the car and where's the jack? <laughs> the spare is flat. Come on. Oh, yeah. You walk away from I can do all things in Christ <laughs> to kicking the car, calling it things that some of you all speak like sailors. You just come into the church and act like you're holier than thou. Come on, can I get a witness? Come on, Russell, give me a witness. Don't leave me out there. I'm not saying you do, but you know people that come in and say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. And then they go out there and they start talking, and man, you're like, What kind of Tasmanian devil is that? See, you think that I don't know these things. You know how I know these things? Because I was once those things but the difference is I can admit those things that I once was some of you all Mother Teresa you, you won't even raise that you're like that's not me pastor yes. well guess what you squeeze toothpaste hard enough something comes out right yes. like a wine press you know what that is they press the grapes beyond its capability and stuff comes out so if you're going to say that, I'm going to challenge you to live by that. So next time everything comes against you, stand up and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Amen. No two believers who are both walking in the spirit of God. No two believers who are walking in the spirit of God. See, you notice why I'm saying that? No two believers who are walking in the spirit of God can be at one with one another. Amen. So some of you all have a root you need to cut tonight. Some of you all have, maybe it's an ex-spouse, maybe it's an ex-mother-in-law, it's an ex-father-in-law, it's a cousin, it's a nap. Some of y'all ain't going to get your blessing unless you cut that root. Because you know what roots do? Weeds are very smart. And I don't even know if they have brains. I'm going to ask God if they do. But they go and they wrap themselves around the vegetation. And they rob the nutrients and the water from the vegetation until it dies. Well, that root is robbing you of your spiritual nutrient. And your spiritual blessing. And you know what those roots come through? They don't come at a billboard on, on I-40 that says, oh, this is your root. They come through people. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And they come through family. See, I don't know about you, but I can be offended by any old person that I don't know out on the street, but let family offend me. That hurts, right? So you're going like this. Can I get it, man? Does it hurt when family offends you? Yes. How much more do you think when we offend God? When we offend God, you think he hurts? Yeah. Yes. He hurts. How many of you want to stop offending God? So let's cut the root tonight. God's speaking to some of your hearts as I'm speaking now. There's something in you that you won't let go. There's something in you that you give power and authority to. Can I tell you why? It happened in 1976 and we're in 2020 and you're still talking about it. 
It happened in 2019 and we're 2020 and you're still talking about it. Every opportunity that I have to talk to you, brother, I want to talk to you about my offenses and who offended me and why they offended me. But can you imagine when you turn that morning into glory, into shouting, into joy, and you say, I am not going to give power and authority to that root anymore. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about what God is doing. Let's talk about what God has done through me and what he's not going to stop doing. Let's take that ugly root and get rid of it and start proclaiming the praises and the mercy and the grace of Christ Jesus. That's what we need. And that's what's going to strengthen us. So if you are in the spirit, and that spirit is of God, you cannot be war at war with one another anymore. See, the strongest statement, and I want to share this with you. God gave this to me. The strongest statement someone can make is usually in the form of a question. I'm going to tell you what that question is. It gets us to thinking about figuring out what the problem is. See, James is speaking to them about the fightings being caused because of the worldliness in their lives. And I don't want to lose you, so let's go back to read verse 1, because we haven't even got to verse 2. Where do wars and fights come from among you? He's asking a question. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? See, any Christian, and I say this loosely, that cannot forgive is living in the world. Any Christian that does not make God their primary, but make them the secondary and the third and the fourth and the fifth, is not living in the spirit of God. They're living in this world. Can I share something with you? I, on a Friday night, man, I used to run to ski high. Can't wait to get off work. And man, give me an 18 pack of Bud Light. Did I ever ask him, wait, wait, you're charging me tax on top of the Bud Light that I ordered? I am, man, I didn't care. Give it to me. I, didn't, I don't even remember the price back then. I haven't drank in probably 18 years. I don't know what the price of that was back then. But would you like to come to church today? I go to Ancient of Days Worship. Oh, no. no. I, I, I'm not. I'm, the church thing, it doesn't, it doesn't fit me. A bunch of hypocrites. You know what I love when someone says a bunch of hypocrites? You're speaking what's in your heart. See, we want to call other people hypocrites, but when you say something, when someone says something like that, they're speaking what's in their heart. Somebody help me out here, and I'm not going to quote the scripture from out of the heart. Say it again. From out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Why is it that we have to talk people into going to a church where they're going to receive blessings that do not come back void? Blessings that are forever. He's going to give you an opportunity to plant seeds so that when you get to heaven, you'll have a beautiful castle in the sky. The word says that. But we, we, we don't want to do those kind of things. I remember when I was out there on the streets of Albuquerque looking for drugs. I never argued with the drug dealer on how much he was willing to sell me the drugs. I needed it. I wanted it. But... I'll be darned if someone will talk me into going to church. If someone talked me into reading the Bible. See, now I can turn it around. Now I know why the devil tried to keep me from being dedicated and obedient to the church. Amen. Because church is where you build yourself up. Amen. Church is where you begin to love. Amen. Well, Pastor, I've been hurt. I've been sexually abused. Can God not take that? Amen. Pastor, I've had an abortion. God doesn't look upon the abortion. He looks upon the repentance of the abortion. And guess what God does? Because he loves. He now uses you that have had abortions. And I don't know why I'm going here. And you begin to have people come in your path to say, I'm thinking about getting an abortion. Don't do it. Well, what do you mean don't do it? How, what, do you, what do you mean? Because I've been there. You know, God forgave me. I, I no longer sorrow in that. But let me tell you, don't do it. See, what the devil meant for harm, now God turns it for your good. Yeah. Hey, brother, I, I hate people, man. I, I, I can't forget people. And then you have an encounter. I'm using you as an example. You have an encounter with God. And then God starts to change you from the inside out. Not from the outside in, from the inside out. 
And then now you can go to people who can't forgive other people and say, I was once there. If you did me wrong, man, I could not forgive you and I would never forget. But now God lives in me. And because God lives in me, I understand what it is to forgive those. You see how we can change things around this evening? But we have to be willing to change those things around. If we're stiff neck, it ain't never gonna happen. Stiff neck doesn't get us anywhere. The word humble in Greek means to come in adoration of Jesus Christ. See, humble does not mean to stand upright. I'm getting a little bit ahead of my message. It means to bow down in the front of royalty in the presence of righteousness. Yeah. But see, when we're bowed down, can I tell you something? How many of you used to fight in the streets? You know the most dangerous part is, I remember getting taken to the ground and the guy was standing up and I was down on the ground. I was in a vulnerable place because he began to kick me in the face. And the only thing I could do is I couldn't get up because he was kicking, kicking. I could just cover up. Now I understand that that's a place of humbleness because the world has instilled so much of us that we have to fight for what's ours, but when we're in a position of humbleness, we have to rely on God to take care of us. So, so that strongest statement is fighting. You know what fighting means? It's, it means to be at odds with something. Because the worldliness that lives in us affects There should be no reason to fight. Did you catch that? We are dead in Christ, right? There is no reason to fight because now Christ is fighting for you. He's fighting through you. You're not fighting for victory. You're fighting in victory. You know what a great theologian says? The devil will wrestle with you. But he cannot pin you. You know what that means? When they pin you and wrestle and you've lost the fight. The devil will wrestle with you, but he cannot pin you. You know why? Because you're fighting a defeated foe. He's been defeated at the middle cross of Calvary. He was defeated many, many years ago. So we're going to wrestle with the ways of this world, with the enemy. But can you tell you, when he's wrestling with you, you look at him and say, you're never going to pin me. Because you're never going to win. You know why? Because my father has won. Yes. And you know what? The more that I fight with the ways of this world, is the stronger I become. The more you fight with this world, is the stronger God makes you to be. And you know what? That's called spiritual maturity. You know why people aren't spiritually mature? Can I get someone to raise a hand? So I feel like I'm, you know, <laughs> preaching to somebody. There, you thank you. It's because we don't stay long enough in the battle to be mature. Yeah. Yeah. Church is the battlefield. Okay, some of you, I love seeing your faces, man. This this is why God has called me to do this because, man, to see people hearing the word of God, and I always ask God, man, why did you use somebody so jacked up like me? And you know what he tells me? Because you said, here, am I use me? <laughs> I didn't say you're jacked up because we're all jacked up. But not many answer that cry, here, am I use me? Silver, so, can I go there? Every time we do a feed, we've had this church up to 70 members, even 100, right? Everybody's like, ooh, yeah, I'm feeling the spirit. Sign me up. And Sylvia comes up to me, and we used to get all excited, me and Gina and Sylvia. We have three pages of people willing to help. But you know, now when we have three pages, I say throw it, throw all three of them away, and let's hope for two. Mm -hmm. Come on. Remember that song, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, right? Yeah, Ain't No Valley Low. See, we get people to sign up because they have an emotional relationship with God. Oh, I'm feeling you, Jesus. But when it comes down to doing the nitty gritty, I remember one time, me and Silver were talking about this. We were feeding a lot of people and we had a whole list of people signed up. And we have what you call, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we have some Model T's up in this church, man, that do more work than some of you new Porsches. You know what I mean by that? I got my mom. I got my mother-in-law, man. They're, they have their hand to the plow. And they're what? 90s? 80s? 90s? <laughs> I'll just play. I'll just play. I got to make it fun. You know, they're, you know what? They put their hand to the plow. 
They make some of us 20, 30, 40, 50 year olds look like we're a bunch of lazy people. Remember, we've gone out with them and we've done what we had to do, right? But can you imagine when you hear this message this evening and you say, ain't nothing gonna stop me from sowing seeds yeah. into a ground that is plentiful, yeah. into a ground where people need the word of Jesus Christ? And I wanna be a seed planter. And for some of you seed planters, there will be someone that comes around and waters those seeds. Yeah. And then when the plant begins to grow, there will be some that come to trim them. We all have a part in the kingdom, right? So we have an opportunity to begin to do what God has called you to do. Let's quit playing church. Let's be the church. Yes. Right? Amen. If we're going to quote scripture, let's quote it in the good and the bad. Amen. When we're going to quote scripture, let's live on the scripture we quote because when the more you quote scripture, there is no good and there is no bad. It's all joy in the presence of God. Amen. Because I don't know about you, but how many of you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, right? How many of you have just, or pick and choose, I'm going to read this book. Or how many of you just are stuck on Proverbs and Psalms? No. Come on. No. You Bible school teacher know what I'm talking because this is what one of our professors told us. If you've been walking five plus years and you're stuck on Psalms and Proverbs, there's a problem. Because now you wonder why there's no channel of communication. Because God's word is from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you like to read books? When you're reading a good novel, do you stop? Well, there's a good story I want to tell you about. And it starts with Genesis. Yeah. And it ends with Revelations. Yeah. And when you get your heart right and you begin to dive in this book... Man, you don't ever want to let it go. You don't want to let it go, right? You know, I don't know about some of y'all, but I gave up the Dallas Cowboys a long time ago. I used to watch them almost every time I had an opportunity. Now, I, I really don't care because I got other things to do. There's word that needs to be read. There's prayers that needs to be said. There's things that God needs to communicate with us, but how does he communicate with the satellite that's broken? There's no communication. How does he communicate with someone that's so filled with the ways of the world, but they have no room for God? How does he communicate? He communicates by you saying, this day is the day that I'm going to begin to surrender. I love when someone says, I can't do it. You know, actually they're right. We can't do a lot of stuff. But have you ever asked God to do it for you? Amen. Or we say, I don't want to do it. I'd rather have you say, I don't want to do it. You know, at least we're truthful, right? Mm -hmm. Then I can't do it. Yeah. Because God right now is in the miracle making business and he can do something through yeah. you. And he's willing to do something through you. So as we close, God gave me a song that I want to play for the congregation. But I want to finish with verse one. Your desires for pleasure that war in your members. What type of desire is this that leads to conflict? Can I tell you what they are? Write this down. One of them is covetousness. Why is covetousness a conflict? I'll tell you. Because you lust for things that you do not have. Have you ever asked yourself, I don't have them because maybe God doesn't want me to have them? That's, right. That's number one, covetousness. You lust for something you do not have. We don't have to lust for God's love. He gives it freely. Number two, anger and animosity. Yeah. Why does anger and animosity lead to conflict amongst the believers? You want to know why? Because it leads to hatred, which leads to murder. Mm. See, we look at murder as going out and killing somebody, but we have already killed them with our thoughts and our hearts. I'm going to do something because i got a few more minutes. How many of you, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to think about this. How many of you know that you should should forgive somebody but you're not willing to 
I didn't just look at the congregation and know it's all of you. You know why? Did you know that you burned them in your heart? And can I give you what the Bible says? That if you do not love them, you do not love him? But what happens when you break that root of carnality? What happens when you say, you know what, God? In my heart, they don't deserve it. But your word says that I need to give it. And you know, don't talk about what they did to you because that's already water under the bridge. A duck can go underwater and come back up and the water just trickles off of him. He's waterproof. Can you imagine when Christians just allow the sins of this world, the unforgiveness, just to trickle off of them? And you know, can I tell you something? When you do forgive that person, there's going to be another one that's going to come knocking at your door. Probably in the church. Probably in the family. Probably your next door neighbor. Maybe a co-worker. But the better you get at it, is the better you become Mm -hmm. with it. And next thing you know, you're just loving them. You're loving them. The first five years of being a pastor, I wanted to quit. There's only two people I've really shared my heart with because my wife and Sylvie has been with us from the beginning. And there'll be times I call them up and say, I'm done with this, I quit. And I've talked to some of y'all and you could hear some of the elders of the church yelling at me in the background. And you know why they're yelling at me? Because we had a meeting and they said, we need to ask the church for more money. And I said, I'm not gonna do that. Well, uh, uh, you're gonna do that because we are the board. I said, you ain't my God. And I remember calling some of y'all and you could hear them yelling in the background. Remember that time I called you, you could hear them yelling at me. And I wanted to quit the first five years. Now the sixth year, I really don't care. (laughs) Seventh year, man, hard as a rock. Hard as a dove, but hard as a rock. Now when you get to the ninth years, I can imagine Pastor Pablo, oh Lord, have mercy, hallelujah, I won't have no hair by then. (laughs) But now that I'm in the ninth year, something happens, I'm like, okay, so be it. I've had people come up and say, and I begin to close, say, well, if you don't do this, I'm going to say this. Well, do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. God has protected me from the beginning. He'll protect me to the end, and he's not going to stop. Amen. But before I say, Gina, we got to make so-and-so a music director because they're threatening not to come to church. I've even had some guy, and I close, and I want you to know how crazy there are wars amongst the church. I had one guy come up to me and say, if you don't make me an elder, I'll stop giving. This guy, this guy in our church, and you know what? That's how I know God uses the devil. This guy every week would give $3,000 a week in my life. Every week. And you know how I know? Because I really don't care what people give. He would come up and say, oh, will all these hundreds fit in the in the offering? Sure will. Sure will. <laughs> and you know what he told me when he left? He goes, well, I own that church. I go, no, God used the devil to help start this church. <laughs> we started with nothing, Floyd. No, remember that song? No tengo dinero, un podre no más. We didn't have no money. But he sent the devil to give us money. And because the devil's now gone, the church is where it's at. Because God will use the evil to bring what he needs to bring in the church. So that you can sit there and you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he can empower you. And he can get you ready. And you can get to stand and say, you know what? We're going to worship now. And I'm not going to worship like a stiff neck. Stand up, Gina. Just you up. I'm not going to worship like this. I'm going to worship in the presence of a living God, right? I don't care if you can sing. I don't care what you can do. All I care is that you show reverence to God because the beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. So if you have an addiction here this evening, allow the Holy Spirit to begin to break that. Allow God to begin to take that. If you have a root of carnality, if you're stingy, if you can't forgive, God is giving you an opportunity to stand upright and let those bones that were once dead begin to rattle and
that know that God does not create mistakes, that God created you for a purpose, for a reason. He created you to go out into the work field and tell them what you heard this evening and tell them who your Lord is and tell them why you will serve this world. But you serve God because when you serve God, God begins to give it to you. He begins to pour it on you. He begins to touch you. Things begin to happen. Our children begin to see the gospel of Jesus Christ. They begin to have hope. When something goes their way, they stand upon the precepts of what Flood did, what Lillian did, what Vince did. They saw that Vince was happy, even when he shouldn't be happy. And they say, I can do what Vince did. Why? Because God lives in him, and God can live in you this evening. Stand up and let's worship. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.